I'm going to be working from this photo that was given to me a good few years ago. In fact, you can see where I've worked off it before. I have painted it before, but I really like it. Um, I'm a big fan of painting old buildings and cities and old towns, particularly these old Mediterranean uh, places. Um, but what I want to sort of make um, an emphasis on is there's the corner of this building here and uh, a road that comes in from the left in this from, in this sort of direction and, and I'm imagining the light coming from that direction because it's um, it's not obvious actually the shadows aren't that obvious in this in this photo but I want to make the most of that light direction so it would illuminate this part of the right hand building over here the fact that this building on the left is all in shadow um, would probably mean I, I'd like to see this part of this building in shadow as well and that will create a, a big tonal contrast particularly horiz horizontally across the ground here up in this L shape onto the building um, and then um, that would be light and surrounded by the sh more shadowy, air shadowy areas um, and then the light will come across the tops of these buildings falling on these furthest uh, buildings there at the back in a nice diagonal fashion. So um, the only uh, thing, other thing I probably need to change is I'm not keen, let me just get rid of that a minute, not keen on this modern awning that's here. Uh, let me just point it out again just so you know exactly what I'm talking about here. Not particularly keen on this modern awning. It has some sort of stanchions um, I sort of want to see the place as it was perhaps before that modern awning was installed and it was just left to this sort of market area at the back here. And one other thing that I would certainly change um, and that is the place and position of m my figures. Mainly the fact that I, I, don't, I don't like chopping off my foreground figures as, as the photo does here. You know, we've got this figure here and um, uh, I, I'm much happier um, seeing the full length figures in the foreground. So I'm needing to sort of lift the whole um, uh, aspect up a little bit. So if I do that and the eye line, the eye line through this painting, because this is flat ground, you can see the eye line perfectly here that our figure in the foreground shares the same eye line as those figures um, that are much smaller in the background down there. So by lifting that to say somewhere around here, obviously that will affect how I, uh, it'll affect the perspective of the buildings a little bit, but it will enable me to put figures uh, closer to us here, um, but they will, their entire body length will be within the um, edges of the painting. So that's my plan um, and fingers crossed it might go according to plan. So let's get started. Here is my image, the photo uh, that we were just looking at. The paper that I'm working on today is a piece of Bockingford watercolor paper, 15 inches by 11. It's not surface, N-O-T, um, and it is 140 pound. I tape it down either two sides or four sides and um, doesn't buckle too much. I paint quite a lot. Um, I use a lot of paper during the course of a week so I don't really get the opportunity to pre-stretch my paper. I do like working on pre-stretched paper um, but um, it would take me two days really to stretch the amount of paper that I use in one week. So uh, I find by using this decorator's tape, this masking tape, it's fine. It does buckle a little bit um, but when it dries out um, after about a day or so. It does um, sort of shrink back to uh, a sort of relative flatness. So let's get started with the drawing. I will speed this, this bit up. Um, a little bit um, so as not to eat into the actual demonstration time but my initial concern is really just to get through the um, the main shapes the big shapes and I generally work as I am now 
uh, along the skyline where the buildings sort of meet the sky. So here we are, um, I've speeded this bit up and um, just keeping the photograph to hand and the things that I'll be checking are things like the perspective lines coming off the right hand building and how they meet on the um, how that perspective line actually um, converges on the eye line so um, the eye line uh, being the same as the horizon line so that line is coming down to about here and that little mark there that I'm making is where that perspective line lands on the eye line on the horizontal eye line so the corresponding um, these ledges and lintels of this right hand building will all converge in the same spot so just erasing a couple of pencil marks that weren't right get them out the way otherwise they will throw me while I'm working so here's my sort of arch on the right hand side don't make too much uh, of the detail of things like that in the initial stages. I tend to, as long as I'm happy with the line, the verticals, the um, directional lines, I tend to sort of um, leave any um, uh, changes and improvements to the to the paintbrush. So I'm just getting, just dotting in um, m a couple of figures. Notice their heads are all on the same eye line as this is flat ground this sort of courtyard area or this street is flat ground. I put the awning in on the left hand building here um, and this is how again how I tend to work. I work around the scene, around the composition to make sure that it's all in balance and it's all cohesive from one side of the street to the other and that's why I'm adjusting the angles at the base of the walls there from left side of the street to the right side of the street over there. So um, because the horizontal plane must uh, work, it must make sense from the left hand side of the street and I've deliberately put in uh, an awkward line there on the left hand side, I've just erased it in the speed of things um, but just to show you how it would look wrong if on the ground level if I didn't get that right. So back there um, it's a case of um, now seeing the direction of other uh, lines. This one here is flat to us, it's square to us, so there's no perspective on that sort of red building. And just getting the, uh, the skyline against this, the um, buildings there. And I, I'll put my windows in roughly where I think they need to be. I don't you know, as you, as, as you can see, I don't tend to want to put shutters in the in the windows. I don't want to put um, handles on the doors. Um, these are the the sketch is always just to sort of nail the position of everything. Position, scale, balance, composition, um, design. That's those are the things that are, are uppermost always when I'm drawing. And you'll see me from time to time erase something if I feel as though by moving it, it'll um, benefit the painting. So, you know, a building isn't a building without windows and doors. Um, so there's a lot of <laughs> wall surface. So it's the uh, windows and doors that make all the difference. So I'm positioning a couple of my small figures. It'll be um, the people doing their shopping uh, in the, around this market area. Um, and again, their heads are all more or less on the same height. Placing the parasols uh, of the marketeers, stalls and stands. Just checking things over again. And I often run my perspective lines right up to the um, to to the horizon line just to make sure sure things are working. Always like a few um, telecommunic oh, communication cables going across the street. They could also be cables that that, um, that they adorn 
with bunting as they like. They do like their sort of fie um, fiestas and street bunting and things like this. Um, yeah, so I'm just making some divisions um, now from one edge of a building to the next without, hopefully without going too heavy uh, in that respect. So there's a little bit of checking over of things really here. Getting my photo back, making sure I'm happy with everything. A couple of areas there that I felt looked a little bit odd. There was a square shape there that I didn't like. Just going a little bit heavy with the pencil work. And mostly I'm sort of okay, I think, with that. Um, so it's time to get the paintbrush out and get some paint on. So these are the two brushes I'll be using. Um, starting with the brush in my, on the right, actually, uh, there. And that's my wash brush, which holds a lot more paint. So I'm coming in with the first wash. I'll start up here in the sky. Uh, this is just a very pale, watery mix of cerulean blue with a little bit of cobalt blue with it in it. It hardly registers, but it's just so that I can get um, some cools established um, both in the sky and slightly strong, as you can see here, on the furthest buildings and to the left slightly because those will be in a, a cool shadow territory. This is the addition of a little bit of raw sienna. Um, actually, I think it's a mix of raw and burnt sienna. I'm deliberately going in at the tops of these buildings knowing that the sky wash is still damp and that'll allow that warm color just to leach into the lower parts of the sky a bit so i'm i'm, I'm jumping rapidly between cool washes and, and warm washes they're all very weak um, it's really just to sort of get myself off the mark and make a start so you can see i've gone back in with the the blue mix again here and i'm looking at that area on the left which is the top of an awning so i'll sort of avoid that and maybe i can make use of it um, later. I'll continue uh, with the warm hits. There's that building facing us and the left hand building. This left hand building will go a lot darker but I just um, just want to establish these early washes and make sure that um, my warms are where my warms should be and my cools are where my cools should be. So I've just picked up a little bit of cadmium red here I'm just painting all the wall areas, really painting around that awning that's popping out off the side wall. We'll leave that till later. And just running through areas, allowing things to drift, allowing the, the these weak washes to drift into each other. And at the same time, um, trying to avoid any chance of um, hard edges occurring where I don't want them, basically. So this that I'm putting on now is a slightly, slightly stronger version of the sky color. And notice I'm using directional um, brush strokes. And that area there will be, when it dries out, a lot lighter, which will be my um, the area of ground, hard surface, that uh, gets some of this sort of late afternoon looking sunshine. So it's always about, you know, how far the object is away. That That's what I'm thinking about when, when it comes to colour temperature control. Here we go with a nice hit of burnt sienna. I will try to go around some of the um, this rather ornate doorway that's on this right hand building because there was some sort of white colored stonework 
uh, around as a, a sort of facade around the edge of the doorway quite like that a little bit of this warmth down the center which will be later rendered darker to show that it's a sort of recessed void interior I also like just to get a little bit of reflection, vertical reflection, even on streets um, that are not wet, because hard surfaces still reflect, even though they're not wet surfaces. So that's why I tend to use the odd vertical brush stroke uh, in the foreground. So I went in with a little bit of warmth in that left hand corner at the back of the buildings because my shadows when they go in eventually um, that'll give the shadows a little bit more depth so being careful to go around most of those parasols at the back there's a nice sense of horizontal down the back end of this street uh, in the market area so just picking up the hairdryer for the first time here giving you the quick dry off because of um, I want to get in with some dry brushwork um, a hint of detail but I'll um, just speed this this bit up so these two little brushes um, are my sort of detailing brushes uh, one is a synthetic, the other is a synthetic uh, natural blend. Um, and these are the two brushes I use mostly for my detail work. And what I'm looking to do is basically make a start uh, getting some of these windows and doors in, uh, which allows me, once they're dry, to uh, put further washes over them without them um, looking hard-edged. It softens the edges of them and makes them look a lot uh, more... Uh, more befitting I suppose because um, if you sort of leave all your detail to the very end there is a danger that um, you actually get uh, a, an effect that looks like you, you, th these dark details have been cut out and stuck on I'm also using a little uh, jar lid here pickle jar lid which is my way of getting um, my rich mix is um, nice and dark, sort of like almost dry, dry brush technique um, because I find if you're taking um, paint from your main palette those little wells in the palette tend to fill up with water off the brush every time you pick a brush but by using this little isolated mini palette I can make sure that the um, paint mix is not getting too much water in the mix um, as it's essential to to be using a um, a dry paint mix sort of always feel happier when I've managed to get a few details in and I mention this quite often um, when I'm doing demonstrations but um, I this isn't a traditional way of working I, I personally like to see a little bit of uh, detail at this stage um, rather than leave all the detail till the end for mention uh, for reasons sorry that I just mentioned um, a lot of these marks will be softened when um, when other washes go over the top so I'm looking for sort of the marks I'm looking for are really the little nuances the little dark shady areas around the edges of windows the recesses of windows the recesses of doorways underneath um, lintels on the buildings at the edges as I'm doing now the corners of a building um, anywhere that I think will need a little bit of um, clarification um, so that the viewer c can easily read what's going on and I think l line work and this type of detail work is essential for that it works for me um, I've tried in the past working 
like other watercolorists by where they put multiple layers uh, of washes down um, and I, I it doesn't work for me I mean I think they do a fantastic job and um, you know in the way they do it um, but and I think it's important that you need to find a method and approach that works for you once you've found that method um, it's surprising how quickly I think that your um, your own personal stamp on your paintings will start appearing so you just find to try different ways don't don't uh, not even the way I, I I'm suggesting or proposing um, give it a go by all means I mean I I've, I've been teaching this method for years and it does work for some people I, I, it, it's not going to work for everybody um, but uh, yeah as I say that to me it allows me to keep track of the uh, of what's actually in the scene so if I I know from past um, experience if I just keep putting washes on in a tra traditional style my paintings always look a little bit heavy and are overworked by the end of it so it when I paint this way it looks a little bit odd um, looks a little bit ugly in some areas but I know the areas that will receive further washes and therefore um, see a lot of softening of, of this detail that I'm putting in with the small brush. This early stage detail, as you can see there, I just picked up the line of the right hand building lintel and that ties things in from the right hand side of this closer building to what was going on along the roof line of the distant buildings. Just jumping across there. So nobody, it, it's an interesting thing. I, I, nobody can really teach you um, to that nth degree um, as to how you approach, how how you render uh, these details. Most of these little details are nothing more than small abstract marks. But to me, they make every bit of sense the, the each mark makes perfect sense for instance this is the top of that archway it's 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 not a boring shape that f you know that, that that has to be a semicircle i don't see it like that i see it as a very abstract shape and um i don't even sort of on this occasion make that much effort to g give the shape clean edges the strength of the paint is important um brings things forward so those 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 sort of shapes bring bring things forward so i'm just paying a bit more attention to the background here and what's going on what i think is going on you know even a good photo doesn't reveal all the secrets of the place that's the thing so you know i i do not i really don't see a point in um trying to get uh, get the details so precise because the best of uh, the best of us the most um those that are very good at making observation are probably still going to struggle and and what do you do if you if you if you can't find the, the um exactly what's going on there you have to self express you have to make it up so I'm happy I'm perfectly happy with that in fact I'm more comfortable with the making up of bits and pieces than I am with the um, direct copying of details as long as the overall design is accurate um, and bears good resemblance to the um, to the place or the object that I'm representing in my painting then I'm more than happy with that but it's not ever going to be, uh, you know, a, a, a photographic copy. So there is uh, my rigger brush. I've just picked up a rigger brush and I'm back to this little strong mix of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna in my pickle jar lid. The good old pickle jar lid. And I'm thinking about these cables, these communication wires um 
these uh, masts and TV aerials really like those sort of details as they break uh, up that area above the buildings and into the sky they sort of tie the sky and the buildings together a bit um, and lines across these streets are everywhere in these towns you know they places that they like to hang their bunting from when they've got their fiestas and um, carnivals and things I find the the line a, a, a powerful, a really powerful part of what I do. Um, I, I am a huge fan of, of pen and wash and uh, line work in general. I'll just make a few sort of directional lines across the street here with the rigger brush. Always good for tying in the... Um, a good and effective way of tying in the perspective and I'm always looking for that always got an eye on the entire design even though I might be working on one small area of a building on the left hand side or the right hand side I'm always thinking about what I do there and how it impacts upon the rest of the painting as a whole it's really important to, to think that way it might be a little dot here and a little dot there, or a window here and a window there, but it, a, a thought has got to be given every time you, you, you make an additional mark to, to how it's going to affect the entire whole, the, 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 the overall uh, composition and design. So I've got time to put the shadow on now and I've just picked up a mix of ultramarine blue and a little bit of burnt sienna just to dull it down a little bit and this is the one inch wash brush that I'm using and um, I'll sometimes use a one inch flat brush for this. It depends on how big, how much shadow I'm actually creating because this is this there is a, a lot of shadow in this painting I'm using a wash brush. It's a wash brush with a uh, with a neat shape to it so it's not like a hog brush or a rough brush it is a watercolor brush um, holds a lot of paint and water but it is also quite a neat neat shape to it so I'm just being careful down there to paint around anything that's going to be catching um, surface light like the tops of the parasols And of course, this building on the left is going to receive um, a fair bit of shadow. So I'm warming this shadow up a little bit as it's much closer to us. Although the basic mix is still the ultramarine blue, it's got a lot more burnt sienna, well, a bit more burnt sienna in it, but it's got a bit of uh, alizarin crimson in it, which keeps it cool. Now, this is the shadow that I really like doing. This is the um, the angled shadow um, coming off. So it's cast shadow from the left hand buildings. It runs through the top there a little bit where there are recesses to some of those um, balconies and things like that. But there's that lovely um, angled shadow shape in the back. Being a bit careful again down at the bottom not to paint over my parasols. Just cutting around them don't want them to look too neat but it does it immediately shows the parasols off as soon as uh, as soon as you cut round them in a sort of negative fashion so it does call for a bit of practice working like this um, and you need to get used to using large brushes in, in quite a delicate way I think we perhaps sometimes panic when we pick up a large brush thinking we can't be particularly sort of um, adept at using a large brush in small for making small areas making sorry making shapes in small tight areas but you you can and it just requires a little bit of practice and the angling that the angle that you use on your wrist and your hand 
um, it, it's quite a can be quite an energetic sort of um, uh, process really um, but you can see how the light suddenly appears as I say in watercolor you can't paint light but you can paint shadows and it's the shadows that gives you the light I've picked up a little bit of warm color in a smaller round brush here it's a bit of burnt sienna a little bit of cadmium red and um, you'll see me just apply it to this near corner this has got to be done obviously while the um, while that shadow mix is still wet so it's just bringing the corner of that building forward a little bit so as and when I see necessary I will go back to the small brush uh, from time to time um, j just to make sure I'm in I'm keeping in touch with what's happening this is ground level here that I wanted to sort of show off pair of legs there of a figure underside of the awning on the left there needs a little darker sort of sh shadowed sort of color to it just decided to warm those couple of those parasols up a little bit so that it looks like they're receiving that lovely warm late afternoon early evening uh, sunshine uh, and I'm just about to uh, apply the shadow the really dark shadow in the foreground along the horizontal ground I'm just going to pick up the trusty um, pickle jar lid my most technical piece of um, art equipment um, with the rigger brush I'm just making sure I'm happy with what stands out in the actual light so if I feel as though an area is being blasted with strong light I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give those areas just a little bit more definition with this type of um, detail again I've just speeded this section up uh, a little bit so that um, y you can see where I'm how I perhaps how I'm reading it um, and just where I need to only go back in with this small amount of detail and I'm just paying a little bit of attention now to the uh, actual market stall area at the back of the street here it sort of needs um, well it needs some attention to, to, to pull it out and make it slightly more noticeable so I'll just infer some busyness back there uh, again this isn't something you know you can teach teach it's a it's an intuitive thing that as to how you you feel it should look um, just how much busyness is required in these different areas is, is a very arbitrary thing um, and it's something that you you can develop you you will get better at it uh, the more often you do it you know because the early days of when when you start out you probably I was certainly no different to anybody else overworking my paintings and um, you know I had disaster after disaster and um, but those disasters are the ones that really pay dividends in the long run 
they're the ones that make you um sort of make you do something about it just you 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 look at i'd have a multitude of ugly paintings strewn around me at the end of a a session and um and uh, all it, it just made me feel as though well right okay there's the bad ones out of the way the good one must be getting closer and it's true that's exactly what happens but you won't get to those good ones unless you get the bad ones out of the way first you can't go from nothing to good you've got to go through all the um you've got to get the the bad ones out of the way the the bad ones must be painted it doesn't matter how many still make bad paintings now you know it's um um but i know that there's rewards if you keep at it just going to speed this little section up it's uh another area of me sort of dotting the i's and crossing the t's so just putting the local color on this building that's facing us uh, which is like a sort of deep darkish terracotta red and I'm just adding a little bit of cadmium yellow to it just to warm it up a little bit further I think that little bit of addition of cadmium yellow um, did I say cadmium red or cadmium? Sorry, it was cadmium yellow I was adding to that red building, just as so that it ties in with the right-hand side building. And just warming up um, the shadowy areas a little bit and making sure I'm happy with the fact that um, there is some warmth in those cooler areas. So about the rigor brush in my hand again here and I, I'm really all I'm doing here is, tr uh, is looking for flat areas if I feel as though the front of a building is looking a bit flat I'm just putting some subtle texture here and there I felt as though there was some need for some extra figures I suddenly noticed that my figures um, there, was, there was a big gap in terms of distance and depth uh, there were figures in the front in the foreground and there were figures right at the back around the market so I decided that a couple of these figures needed to be um, at sort of mid ground so that's what I'm doing here making sure that they've got good um, good shadows always try to paint these shadows with a single brush stroke if you can three three brush strokes sometimes you might even get away sometimes with a fourth brush stroke but you really need to nail it if you can with one brush stroke so I'm just spattering a little bit picking up a little bit of white gouache with the rigger brush I take my white gouache straight from the tube straight out of the neck of the tube of paint um, and again I'm looking for anything that I might be anything that I think might be catching a, a glimmer of sunlight so there may be further sort of cables um, uh, going across the streets in places those places where they they hang their their bunting um, and you'll also see me spatter a little bit So there's our mount. Um, yep, yeah, it's sort of okay. Probably have a look at it again tomorrow and just sort of dot the I's, cross the T's. Other than that, I think it's a reasonable job. From taking this on, from where I left the demonstration that you saw me do, the only amendments that I've actually made. Um, and it was about 24 hours later whereas I just made a little bit more of uh, a couple of my figures ie the one in the foreground here gave a little bit more definition to some of these characters um, add a little bit, bit of color to some of these parasols just to lift that area at the back there 
Um, there's a little bit of sort of my ten, my typical sort of spattering just to create a little bit of atmosphere. Um, made sure I was happy with the horizontal shadows of those figures that were actually um, in the light, in the bright light coming through from this this left hand side here, this gap in the buildings. Um, that's about it really. Uh, I was quite happy with it and um, I hope you've enjoyed this demonstration and um, please remember to uh, subscribe and if you haven't already um, and uh, if you want to have notifications of my newly uploaded uh, videos and demonstrations please remember just to click on that bell icon.